He wrapped their coats, each in turn, around the trunk of a small tree and twisted out the water. He had the boy take off his clothes, and he wrapped him in one of the blankets, and while he stood shivering he wrung the water out of his clothes and passed them back. The ground where they'd slept was dry, and they sat there with the blankets draped over them and ate apples and drank water. Then they set out upon the road again, slumped and cowled, and shivering in their rags like mendicant friars sent forth to find their keep. By evening they at least were dry. They'd studied the pieces of map, but he'd little notion of where they were. He stood at a rise in the road and tried to take his bearings in the twilight. They left the pike and took a narrow road through the country and came at last upon a bridge and a dry creek, and they crawled down the bank and huddled underneath. "'Can we have a fire?' the boy said. "'We don't have a lighter.' The boy looked away. "'I'm sorry, I dropped it. I didn't want to tell you.' "'That's okay. I'll find us some flint. I've been looking, and we've still got the little bottle of gasoline.' "'Okay. Are you very cold?' "'I'm okay.' The boy lay with his head in the man's lap. After a while he said, "'They're going to kill those people, aren't they?' "'Yes.' "'Why do they have to do that? I don't know. Are they going to eat them?' "'I don't know. They're going to eat them, aren't they?' "'Yes. And we couldn't help them because then they'd eat us, too.' "'Yes. And that's why we couldn't help them.' "'Yes. Okay.' They passed through towns that warned people away with messages scrawled on the billboards. The billboards had been whited out with thin coats of paint in order to write on them, and through the paint could be seen a pale palimpsest of advertisements for goods which no longer existed. They sat by the side of the road and ate the last of the apples. "'What is it?' the man said. "'Nothing. We'll find something to eat. We always do.' The boy didn't answer. The man watched him. "'That's not it, is it? It's okay. Tell me.' The boy looked away down the road. "'I want you to tell me. It's okay.' He shook his head. "'Look at me,' the man said. He turned and looked. He looked like he'd been crying. "'Just tell me. We wouldn't ever eat anybody, would we? No, of course not. Even if we were starving? We're starving now. You said we weren't. I said we weren't dying. I didn't say we weren't starving. But we wouldn't. No, we wouldn't.' no matter what. No, no matter what. Because we're the good guys. Yes. And we're carrying the fire. And we're carrying the fire. Yes. Okay. He found pieces of flint or chert in a ditch, but in the end it was easier to rake the pliers down the side of a rock, at the bottom of which he'd made a small pile of tinder soaked in gas. Two more days, then three. They were starving right enough. The country was looted, ransacked, ravaged, rifled of every crumb. The nights were blinding cold and casket black, and the long reach of the morning had a terrible silence to it, like a dawn before battle. The boy's candle-colored skin was all but translucent. With his great, staring eyes, he'd the look of an alien. He was beginning to think that death was finally upon them and that they should find some place to hide where they would not be found. There were times when he sat watching the boy sleep that he would begin to sob uncontrollably, but it wasn't about death. He wasn't sure what it was about, but he thought it was about beauty or about goodness, things that he'd no longer any way to think about at all. They squatted in a bleak wood and drank ditch water strained through a rag. He'd seen the boy in a dream laid out upon a cooling board, and woke in horror. What he could bear in the waking world he could not by night, and he sat awake for fear the dream would return. They scrabbled through the charred ruins of houses they would not have entered before, a corpse floating in the black water of a basement among the trash and rusting ductwork. He stood in a living room partly burned and open to the sky, the water buckled boards sloping away into the yard, soggy volumes in a bookcase, he took one down and opened it and then put it back. Everything damp, rotting. In a drawer he found a candle, 
no way to light it. He put it in his pocket. He walked out in the gray light and stood, and he saw for a brief moment the absolute truth of the world, the cold, relentless circling of the intestate earth, darkness implacable, the blind dogs of the sun in their running, the crushing black vacuum of the universe, and somewhere two hunted animals trembling like ground foxes in their cover, borrowed time and borrowed world and borrowed eyes with which to sorrow it. At the edge of a small town they sat in the cab of a truck to rest, staring out a glass washed clean by the recent rains, a light dusting of ash. Exhausted, by the roadside stood another sign that warned of death. The letters faded with the years. He almost smiled. Can you read that? he said. Yes. Don't pay any attention. There's no one here. Are they dead? I think so. I wish that little boy was with us. Let's go, he said. Rich dreams now which he was loath to wake from, things no longer known in the world. The cold drove him forth to mend the fire. Memory of her crossing the lawn toward the house in the early morning in a thin rose gown that clung to her breasts. He thought each memory recalled must do some violence to its origins. As in a party game, say the word and pass it on, so be sparing. What you alter in the remembering has yet a reality, known or not. They walked through the streets wrapped in the filthy blankets. He held the pistol at his waist and held the boy by the hand. At the farther edge of the town they came upon a solitary house in a field, and they crossed and entered and walked through the rooms. They came upon themselves in a mirror, and he almost raised the pistol. "'It's us, Papa,' the boy whispered. "'It's us.' He stood in the back door and looked out at the fields and the road beyond, and the bleak country beyond the road. On the patio was a barbecue pit made from a fifty-five-gallon drum slit endways with a torch and set in a welded iron frame, a few dead trees in the yard, a fence, a metal tool shed. He shrugged off the blanket and wrapped it around the boy's shoulder. I want you to wait here. I want to go with you. I'm only going over there to take a look. Just sit here. You'll be able to see me the whole time. I promise. He crossed the yard and pushed open the door, still holding the gun. It was a sort of garden shed, dirt floor, metal shelves with some plastic flower pots, everything covered with ash. There were garden tools standing in the corner, a lawnmower, a wooden bench under the window, and beside it a metal cabinet. He opened the cabinet, old catalogs, packets of seeds, begonia, morning glory. He stuck them in his pocket. For what? On the top shelf were two cans of motor oil, and he put the pistol in his belt and reached and got them and set them on the bench. They were very old, made of cardboard with metal end caps. The oil had soaked through the cardboard, but still they seemed full. He stepped back and looked out the door. The boy was sitting on the back steps of the house, wrapped in the blankets, watching him. When he turned, he saw a gas can in the corner behind the door. He knew it couldn't have gas in it, yet when he tilted it with his foot and let it fall back again, there was a gentle slosh. He picked it up and carried it to the bench and tried to unscrew the cap, but he could not. He got the pliers out of his coat pocket and extended the jaws and tried it. It would just fit, and he twisted off the cap and laid it on the bench and sniffed the can. Rank odor, years old, but it was gasoline and it would burn. He screwed the cap back on and put the pliers in his pocket. He looked around for some smaller container, but there wasn't one. He shouldn't have thrown away the bottle. Checked the house. Crossing the grass, he felt half faint, and he had to stop. He wondered if it was from smelling the gasoline. The boy was watching him. How many days to death? Ten? Not so many more than that. He couldn't think. Why had he stopped? He turned and looked down at the grass. He walked back, testing the ground with his feet. He stopped and turned again. Then he went back to the shed. He returned with a garden spade, and in the place where he'd stood, he chucked the blade into the ground. It sank to half its length and stopped with a hollow wooden sound. He began to shovel away the dirt. Slow going. God, he was tired. 
He leaned on the spade. He raised his head and looked at the boy. The boy sat as before. He bent to his work again. Before long he was resting between each shovelful. What he finally unburied was a piece of plywood covered with roofing felt. He shoveled out along the edges. It was a door, perhaps three feet by six. At one end was a hasp with a padlock taped up in a plastic bag. He rested, holding on to the handle of the spade, his forehead in the crook of his arm. When he looked up again, the boy was standing in the yard just a few feet from him. He was very scared. "'Don't open it, Papa,' he whispered. "'It's okay.' "'Please, Papa, please. It's okay. No, it's not.' He had his fists clutched at his chest, and he was bobbing up and down with fear. The man dropped the shovel and put his arms around him. "'Come on,' he said. "'Let's just go sit on the porch and rest a while. Then we can go.' "'Let's just sit for a while. Okay.' They sat, wrapped in the blankets, and looked out at the yard. They sat for a long time. He tried to explain to the boy that there was no one buried in the yard, but the boy just started crying. After a while he even thought that maybe the child was right. "'Let's just sit,' he said. "'We won't even talk. Okay.' They walked through the house again. He found a beer bottle and an old rag of a curtain, and he tore an edge from the cloth and stuffed it down the neck of the bottle with a coat hanger. "'This is our new lamp,' he said. "'How can we light it? "'I found some gasoline in the shed and some oil. "'I'll show you.' "'Okay.' "'Come on,' the man said. "'Everything's okay, I promise.' But when he bent to see into the boy's face under the hood of the blanket, he very much feared that something was gone that could not be put right again. They went out and crossed the yard to the shed. He set the bottle on the bench, and he took a screwdriver and punched a hole in one of the cans of oil, and then punched a smaller one to help it drain. He pulled the wick out of the bottle and poured the bottle about half full, old, straight-weight oil, thick and jellied with the cold, and a long time pouring. He twisted the cap off the gas can, and he made a small paper spill from one of the seed packets, and poured gas into the bottle, and put his thumb over the mouth, and shook it. Then he poured some out into a clay dish and took the rag and stuffed it back into the bottle with the screwdriver. He took a piece of flint from his pocket and got the pair of pliers and struck the flint against the serrated jaw. He tried it a couple of times, and then he stopped and poured more gasoline into the dish. This may flare up, he said. The boy nodded. He raked sparks into the dish, and it bloomed into flame with a low whoosh. He reached and got the bottle and tilted it and lit the wick and blew out the flame in the dish and handed the smoking bottle to the boy. Here, he said, take it. What are we going to do? Hold your hand in front of the flame. Don't let it go out. He rose and took the pistol from his belt. This door looks like the other door, he said, but it's not. I know you're scared. That's okay. I think there may be things in there, and we have to take a look. There's no place else to go. This is it. I want you to help me. If you don't want to hold the lamp, you'll have to take the pistol. I'll hold the lamp. Okay, this is what the good guys do. They keep trying. They don't give up. Okay. He led the boy out into the yard, trailing the black smoke from the lamp. He put the pistol in his belt and picked up the spade and began to chop the hasp out of the plywood. He wedged the corner of the blade under it and pried it up, and then knelt and took hold of the lock, and twisted the whole thing loose, and pitched it into the grass. He pried the blade under the door and got his fingers under it, and then stood and raised it up. Dirt went rattling down the boards. He looked at the boy. Are you all right? he said. The boy nodded mutely, holding the lamp in front of him. The man swung the door over and let it fall in the grass. Rough stairs carpentered out of two-by-tens leading down into the darkness. He reached and took the lamp from the boy. He started to descend the stairs, but then he turned and leaned and kissed the child on the forehead. The bunker was walled with concrete block. A poured concrete floor laid over with kitchen tile. There were a couple of iron cots with bare springs, one against either wall. The mattress pads rolled up at the foot of them in army fashion. 
He turned and looked at the boy, crouched above him, blinking in the smoke, rising up from the lamp, and then he descended to the lower steps, and sat and held the lamp out. "'Oh, my God!' he whispered. "'Oh, my God! What is it, Papa? Come down! Oh, my God, come down!' Crate upon crate of canned goods, tomatoes, peaches, beans, apricots, canned hams, corned beef, hundreds of gallons of water in ten-gallon plastic jerry jugs, paper towels, toilet paper, paper plates, plastic trash bags stuffed with blankets. He held his forehead in his hand. Oh, my God, he said. He looked back at the boy. It's all right, he said. Come down. Papa, come down. Come down and see. He stood the lamp on the step and went up and took the boy by the hand. Come on, he said. It's all right. What did you find? I found everything. Everything. Wait till you see. He led him down the stairs and picked up the bottle and held the flame aloft. Can you see? He said. Can you see? What is all this stuff, Papa? It's food. Can you read it? Pears. That says pears. Yes. Yes, it does. Oh, yes, it does. There was just headroom for him to stand. He ducked under a lantern with a green metal shade hanging from a hook. He held the boy by the hand, and they went along the rows of stenciled cartons. Chili, corn, stew, soup, spaghetti sauce, the richness of a vanished world. Why is this here? the boy said. Is it real? Oh, yes, it's real. He pulled some of the boxes down and clawed it open and held up a can of peaches. It's here because someone thought it might be needed. But they didn't get to use it. No, they didn't. They died. Yes. Is it okay for us to take it? Yes, it is. They would want us to, just like we would want them to. They were the good guys? Yes, they were. Like us. Like us. Yes. So it's okay. Yes, it's okay. There were knives and plastic utensils and silverware and kitchen tools in a plastic box, a can opener. There were electric torches that didn't work. He found a box of batteries and dry cells and went through them, mostly corroded and leaking in acid goo, but some of them looked okay. He finally got one of the lanterns to work and he set it on the table and blew out the smoky flame of the lamp. He tore a flap from the opened cardboard box and chased out the smoke with it, and then he climbed up and lowered the trap door and turned and looked at the boy. What would you like for supper? he said. Pears. Good choice. Pears it is. He took two paperware bowls from a stack of them wrapped in plastic and set them out on the table. He unrolled the mattress pads on the bunks for them to sit on, and he opened the carton of pears and took out a can and set it on the table and clamped the lid with the can opener and began to turn the wheel. He looked at the boy. The boy was sitting quietly on the bunk, still wrapped in the blanket, watching. The man thought he had probably not fully committed himself to any of this. You could wake in the dark, wet woods at any time. These will be the best pears you ever tasted, he said. The best. Just you wait. They sat side by side and ate the can of pears. Then they ate a can of peaches. They licked the spoons and tipped the bowls and drank the rich, sweet syrup. They looked at each other. One more. I don't want you to get sick. I won't get sick. You haven't eaten in a long time. I know. Okay. He put the boy to bed in the bunk and smoothed his filthy hair on the pillow and covered him with blankets. When he climbed up and lifted the door, it was almost dark out. He went to the garage and got the knapsack and came back and took a last look around and then went down the steps and pulled the door shut and jammed one of the handles of the pliers through the heavy inside hasp. The electric lantern was already beginning to dim, and he looked through the stores until he found some cases of white gas in gallon cans. He got one of the cans out and set it on the table and unscrewed the cap and punched out the metal seal with a screwdriver. Then he took down the lamp from the hook overhead and filled it. He'd already found a plastic box of butane lighters, and he lit the lamp with one of them and adjusted the flame and hung it back up. Then he just sat on the bunk. While the boy slept, he began to go methodically through the stores. Clothes, sweaters, socks, a stainless steel basin and sponges and bars of soap, toothpaste and toothbrushes. In the bottom of a big plastic jar of bolts and screws and miscellaneous hardware, 
he found a double handful of gold Krugerrands and a cloth sack. He dumped them out and kneaded them in his hand, and looked at them, and then scooped them back into the jar along with the hardware, and put the jar back on the shelf. He sorted through everything, shifting boxes and crates from one side of the room to the other. There was a small steel door that led into a second room, where bottles of gas were stored. In the corner, a chemical toilet. There were vent pipes in the walls, covered with wire mesh, and there were drains in the floor. It was getting warm in the bunker, and he'd taken off his coat. He went through everything. He found a box of forty-five ACP cartridges and three boxes of thirty-thirty rifle shells. What he didn't find was a gun. He took the battery lantern and walked over the floor, and he checked the walls for any hidden compartment. After a while he just sat on the bunk eating a bar of chocolate. There was no gun, and there wasn't going to be one. When he woke, the gas lamp overhead was hissing softly. The bunker walls were there in the light and the boxes and crates. He didn't know where he was. He was lying with his coat over him. He sat up and looked at the boy asleep on the other bunk. He'd taken off his shoes, but he didn't remember that either, and he got them from under the bunk and pulled them on and climbed the stairs and pulled the pliers from the hasp and lifted the door and peered out. Early morning. He looked at the house and he looked out toward the road, and he was about to lower the hatch door again when he stopped. The vague gray light was in the west. They'd slept the night through and the day that followed. He lowered the door and secured it again and climbed back down and sat on the bunk. He looked around at the supplies. He'd been ready to die, and now he wasn't going to, and he had to think about that. Anyone could see the hatch lying in the yard, and they would know at once what it was. He had to think about what to do. This was not hiding in the woods. This was the last thing from that. Finally he rose and went to the table and hooked up the little two-burner gas stove and lit it, and got out a frying pan and a kettle, and opened the plastic box of kitchen implements. What woke the boy was him grinding coffee in a small hand grinder. He sat up and stared all around. Papa, he said. Hi, are you hungry? I have to go to the bathroom. I have to pee. He pointed with the spatula toward the low steel door. He didn't know how to use the toilet, but they would use it anyway. They weren't going to be here that long, and he wasn't going to be opening and closing the hatch any more than they had to. The boy went past, his hair matted with sweat. What is it? he said. Coffee, ham, biscuits. Wow, the boy said. He dragged a footlocker across the floor between the bunks and covered it with a towel and set out the plates and cups and plastic utensils. He set out a bowl of biscuits covered with a hand towel and a plate of butter and a can of condensed milk. Salt and pepper. He looked at the boy. The boy looked drugged. He brought the frying pan from the stove and forked a piece of browned ham onto the boy's plate and scooped scrambled eggs from the other pan and ladled out spoonfuls of baked beans and poured coffee into their cups. The boy looked up at him. "'Go ahead,' he said. "'Don't let it get cold. What do I eat first? Whatever you like. Is this coffee? Yes, here. You put the butter on your biscuits. Like this. Okay. Are you all right? I don't know. Do you feel okay? Yes. What is it? Do you think we should thank the people? The people? The people who gave us all this. Well, yes, I guess we could do that. Will you do it? Why don't you? I don't know how. Yes, you do. You know how to say thank you. The boy sat staring at his plate. He seemed lost. The man was about to speak when he said, Dear people, thank you for all this food and stuff. We know that you saved it for yourself, and if you were here, we wouldn't eat it no matter how hungry we were, and we're sorry that you didn't get to eat it, and we hope that you're safe in heaven with God. He looked up. Is that okay? he said. Yes, I think that's okay. He wouldn't stay in the bunker by himself. He followed the man back and forth across the lawn while he carried the plastic jugs of water to the bathroom at the rear of the house. They took the little stove with them and a couple of pans, and he heated water and poured it into the tub and poured in water from the plastic jugs. It took a long time, but he wanted it to be good and warm. When the tub was almost full, the boy got undressed and stepped, shivering, into the water and sat. Scrawny and filthy and naked, holding his shoulders, 
The only light was from the ring of blue teeth in the burner of the stove. What do you think? the man said. Warm at last. Warm at last? Yes. Where did you get that? I don't know. Okay. Warm at last. He washed his dirty matted hair and bathed him with the soap and sponges. He drained away the filthy water he sat in and laved fresh warm water over him from the pan and wrapped him shivering in a towel and wrapped him again in a blanket. He combed his hair and looked at him. Steam was coming off of him like smoke. Are you okay? he said. My feet are cold. You'll have to wait for me. Hurry. He bathed and then climbed out and poured detergent into the bath water and shoved their stinking jeans down into the water with a toilet plunger. Are you ready? he said. Yes. He turned down the burner until it sputtered and went out, and then he turned on the flashlight and laid it in the floor. They sat on the edge of the tub and pulled their shoes on, and then he handed the boy the pan and soap, and he took the stove and the little bottle of gas and the pistol, and wrapped in their blankets, they went back across the yard to the bunker. They sat on the cot with a checkerboard between them, wearing new sweaters and socks, and swaddled in the new blankets. He'd hooked up a small gas heater, and they drank Coca-Cola out of plastic mugs, and after a while he went back to the house and wrung the water out of the jeans and brought them back and hung them to dry. How long can we stay here, Papa? Not long. How long is that? I don't know. Maybe one more day. Two. Because it's dangerous? Yes. Do you think they'll find us? No, they won't find us. They might find us. No, they won't. They won't find us. Later, when the boy was asleep, he went to the house and dragged some of the furniture out onto the lawn. Then he dragged out a mattress and laid it over the hatch, and from inside he pulled it up over the plywood and carefully lowered the door so that the mattress covered it completely. It wasn't much of a ruse, but it was better than nothing. While the boy slept, he sat on the bunk, and by the light of the lantern he whittled fake bullets from a tree branch with his knife, fitting them carefully into the empty bores of the cylinder and then whittling again. He shaped the ends with the knife and sanded them smooth with salt, and he stained them with soot until they were the color of lead. When he had all five of them done, he fitted them to the bores and snapped the cylinder shut and turned the gun and looked at it. Even this close, the gun looked as if it were loaded, and he laid it by and got up to feel the legs of the jeans steaming above the heater. He'd saved the small handful of empty cartridge casings for the pistol, but they were gone with everything else. He should have kept them in his pocket. He'd even lost the last one. He thought he might have been able to reload them out of the forty-five cartridges. The primers would probably fit if he could get them out without ruining them. Shave the bullets to size with the box cutter. He got up and made a last tour of the stores. Then he turned down the lamp until the flame puttered out and he kissed the boy and crawled into the other bunk under the clean blankets and gazed one more time at this tiny paradise trembling in the orange light from the heater and then he fell asleep. The town had been abandoned years ago, but they walked the littered streets carefully, the boy holding on to his hand. They passed a metal trash dump where someone had once tried to burn bodies. The charred meat and bones under the damp ash might have been anonymous, save for the shapes of the skulls. No longer any smell. There was a market at the end of the street, and in one of the aisles, piled with empty boxes, there were three metal grocery carts. He looked them over and pulled one of them free and squatted and turned the wheels and then stood and pushed it up the aisle and back again. We could take two of them, the boy said. No. I could push one. You're the scout. I need you to be our lookout. What are we going to do with all the stuff? We'll just have to take what we can. Do you think somebody is coming? Yes, sometime. You said nobody was coming. I didn't mean ever. Ever. 